Hello friends and family. I am back here at home and I just wanted to start off by first and foremost praising God for being who he is and thanking him for time and chances and the ability to love the way that he loves and to show his love. And I wanted to thank you guys for being so gracious in your prayers and your support and just your kindness and your grace for allowing me to take a couple days off to be with my daddy. Um, just an update, he is in hospice care and uh, has been given the prognosis that his time here is limited. Um, he is terminal. It's just kind of a day by day process at this point. We are just taking it a moment at a time. He is 100% in his mind, just physically incapacitated. And so that's the difficult part is knowing that he knows what's going on, but he can't physically do anything about it. And so just continued prayers for the strength of my stepmom to be able to take care of him. That's a really difficult thing too, to get the help that she needs in place. Um, so that's something we're waiting on. And then whatever we are able to do as his daughters to be able to help out with that. We're all so far away from him, so that's the difficult thing. Um, and I had to come back to take care of my own family. And so we are just standing by at this point. But thank you. Um, Bible study continues. God is still good. He is still on the throne. He is gracious and kind to us. And I am believing for my dad's salvation. We were able to love on him and say all of the things we wanted to say and pray with him. And so I believe that God knows his heart. We are going on the assurance that <clears throat> he has said the salvation prayer at times in his life and going on the basis of the scripture that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And I know without a doubt that my daddy believes in God and there has just been a lot of anger. And I believe that God has compassion on those who have been dealt an evil hand, who have had trauma, who have mental illness. I believe uh, without a doubt that God sees through that and to the heart of the person because at the core of who my daddy is, he is the kindest, most generous, loving man. If I can love him as much as I love him, how much more and how much greater the love of our father is to him. So I am believing for that today. With that said, we are continuing in the Bible. We will be playing a little bit of catch up this week. So again, thank you for your grace. Today, I'm going to cover days 230 and 231. I'm gonna do my best. I am caught up in the reading, but it's just a matter of filming all of the videos as we continue to stand by and wait for some news. So let's pray before we get into the word. Heavenly Father, thank you for being our daddy, for being our great almighty God, for being on the throne, our protector, the creator, the alpha, the omega, who knows all things. Lord, we continue to trust in you, your plan for our lives. I know everyone has got something on their heart today that we are believing for. And so we place those things at your feet and trust, Lord, that you will do what you are going to do. You will have your way as we surrender to your will. Thank you for your good and perfect will for every one of us, Lord. We are so grateful for your love and your kindness and your goodness and who you are. May we continue to be able to see that as we read your word today. I pray for revelation, Lord, as we read the Logos. May our eyes, ears, and hearts be open to be able to receive your word. Lord, will you forgive us of our sins, anything that we may have said, done, thought that may have hurt your heart. God, will you just clear that away? Help us to repent of that. Bring it to our attention if we don't even remember what that was. And we just ask for that forgiveness and for the repentance to not return to do something like that again. Help us to forgive others, Lord, who have hurt us. I pray that you will please take away anger. And for anybody who is suffering with any illnesses today, I pray for healing, Lord. And I pray for grace upon them, for your mercy to be upon them, that you'll take away all discomfort, Lord, and that you will give peace to those that are caregiving because we know how difficult of a task that is. And and for those who are suffering, Lord, we take that suffering away and uh, just be with us in these journeys of life, Lord, that sometimes seem difficult. We are grateful for you and your love. And we just place all of these things and all of our requests at your feet today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So starting off here in Jeremiah chapter 38. Now, 
Shephatiah, the son of Matin, Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pasher, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah was saying to all the people. So these guys are known as the princes of Judah. They're basically like the politicians of this day. And they don't like what Jeremiah is saying. Thus says the Lord, he who stays in the city shall die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans shall live. He shall have his life as a prize of war and live. Thus says the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon and be taken. Okay, so same word, yet they don't like it. So now they want Jeremiah to die. Then the official said to the king, let this man be put to death, for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in the city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. Now, when they say the hands of the soldiers, he means they, the morale is basically weakening because of this word that they are hearing. And so now they're gonna throw him into this cistern for this man is not seeking the welfare of this people, and that's actually quite the opposite. He is seeking the welfare of this people, and therefore he's telling them the truth, but they think he's seeking their harm. And King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. So he is now acting like Pilate did with Jesus, where he was like, I wash my hands of this. Y'all do what you want with him, but I want nothing to do with it. Or like Darius with Daniel, when they were wanting to kill Daniel, put him in the lion's den. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guard, letting Jeremiah down by ropes. And if you have ever seen a cistern, it's basically like a well where they threw him down in the bottom. He won't have any food. He'll be exposed to the elements. So he's basically going to die a very slow and painful death. He can't get out because he can't climb up the stone walls. So he will die by famine, by exposure, and by disease. And there was no water in the cistern, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. Now, when Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch who was in the king's house, had heard that they put Jeremiah into the cistern, the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate. Ebed Melech went out from the king's house and said to the king, My lord, the king, these men have done evil in all that they did to Jeremiah the prophet by casting him in the cistern, and he will die there of hunger, for there is no bread left in the city. Now, Ebed Melech, his name means servant of the king, and he is technically a foreigner. And really, he should have had no standing with the king as an Ethiopian or as a foreigner. But God can use whoever he wants to use, and he will use the ordinary to be extraordinary in his plan. And this is exactly what he is doing with this man, Ebed Melech. Now, obviously, Zedekiah always sways with the wind. He did it with the people, and he's going to do it again here with Ebed Melech. Now, the king commanded Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, take 30 men. So these 30 men will be able to help guard him against any rebels who might come against him with this word. So take 30 men with you from here and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So ebed Melech took the men with him and went to the house of the king to a wardrobe in the storehouse and took from there old rags, worn out clothes, which he let down to Jeremiah in the cistern by the ropes. Now at this time, Jeremiah is probably very weak. He's probably very skinny. Then ebed Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, put the rags and clothes between your armpits and the ropes so that he will have a little bit of support. Now Jeremiah did so. Then they drew Jeremiah up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained in the court of a guard. So Jeremiah essentially rescued by the hand of God using ebed Melech. Now King Zedekiah sent for Jeremiah the prophet and received him at the third entrance of the temple of the Lord. The king said to Jeremiah, I will ask you a question. Hide nothing from me. Now he had already done this before, if you don't recall that. He was kind of asking him this word, give me a word, but not in front of everyone. He wanted, you know, seeking the word of God in private. And Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, if I tell you, will you not surely put me to death? So he knows that Zedekiah is not going to be able to handle the word because really nothing has changed here. And if I give you counsel, will you not listen to me? Then King Zedekiah swore secretly to Jeremiah, as the Lord lives who made our souls, I will not put you to death or deliver you into the hand of these men who seek your life. So Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, all right, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel. Notice how God introduces himself through this word. He is the God of the angel armies, the God of Israel, the covenant God. So these are titles that are powerful titles. 
If you will surrender to the officials of King Babel of Babylon, then your life shall be spared, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. So same word, surrender to the enemy, you will live. But if you do not surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hand. Now King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I'm afraid of the Judeans who have deserted to the Chaldeans, lest I be handed over to them, and they deal cruelly with me. So Jeremiah said, You shall not be given to them. Obey now to the voice of the Lord in what I say to you, and it shall be well with you, and your life shall be spared. So these are powerful words here, surrender and obey. Same words we have today for us to surrender to Jesus, to be obedient to the call and to the word. So he is more concerned about his personal safety than anything. And Jeremiah said, obey and it shall be well with you. But if you refuse to surrender, this is the vision which the Lord has shown to me. Behold, all the women left in the house of the king of Judah were being led out to the officials of the king of Babylon and were saying, your trusted friends have deceived you and prevailed against you. Now that your feet are sunk in the mud, they turn away from you. So his obedience is not going to change God's judgment, but what it could do is actually determine the extent of the misery by which they are held to. So this is still the same unwavering message that Jeremiah had spoken before. Same word, but a different urgency. It's a little bit more urgent than before. All your wives and your sons shall be led out to the Chaldeans, and you yourself shall not escape from their hand, but shall be seized by the king of Babylon, and this city shall be burned with fire. Then Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, Let no one know of these things, and you shall not die. So basically, Zedekiah does not want to be blamed, of course. I mean, we already know that he's doing things in secret. He's swaying with the wind, and now he's pleading for him not to tell anyone. If the officials hear that I have spoken with you and came to you and said to you, tell us what you said to the king and what the king said to you, hide nothing from us and we will not put you to death, then you shall say to them, I made a humble plea to the king that he would not send me back to the house of Jonathan to die there. So he's basically trying to put the blame on Jeremiah. Then the, all the officials came to Jeremiah and asked him, and he answered them as the king had instructed him. So they stopped speaking with him, for the conversation had not been overheard. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard until the day that Jerusalem was taken. And now in here in chapter 39, we finally see the fall of Jerusalem. This happening in December of 589 BC or January 588 BC, somewhere between there. In the ninth year of Zedekiah king of Judah, in the tenth month, so that's here between December and January, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. Now this uh, besieging actually lasted about two years. So Babylon was surrounding Jerusalem, pressing them for two years, but they still didn't budge or break before the Lord. They didn't humble themselves before the Lord and surrender the way he told them to. And so now they're going to be broken by Babylon. In the 11th year of Zedekiah in the fourth month, so this somewhere between June and July, 586 BC, on the ninth day of the month, a breach was made in the city that remember that breach being probably somewhere in the wall the fortified walls of the city was broken down then all the officials of the king of Babylon came and sat in the middle gate Nergal Sar Ezer of Samgar Nebusar Sikim the Rabsaris Nergal Sar Ezer the Rabmag with all the rest of the officials of the king of Babylon now when King Zedekiah king of Judah and all the soldiers saw them they fled so obviously fearing now going out of the city at night by the way of the king's garden through the gate between the two walls, and they went toward Araba. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon at Ribla in the land of Hamath, and he passed sentence on him. So remember this prophecy that was spoken by both Ezekiel and Jeremiah. So by Jeremiah in chapter 34 and Ezekiel chapter 12, where they said, you will come face to face with Nebuchadnezzar. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah at Riblah before his eyes, and the king of Babylon slaughtered all the nobles of Judah. So remember, this is the last thing that he sees, is the killing of his own sons before they gouge his eyes out. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. The Chaldeans burned the king's house and the house of the people and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. 
So because he refused to see God, now he is reaping what he sows and he is officially blind because he chose not to see the things of God. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile to Babylon the rest of the people who were left in the city, those who had deserted to him and the people who remained. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah some of the poor people uh, who owned nothing because they would not be a threat to them. And he, they also wanted to keep people in the land so that they could work the land so it wouldn't become desolate and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave command concerning Jeremiah through Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him, look after him well, and do him no harm, but deal with him as he tells you. Now, obviously Jeremiah is one of the few who is given a choice here. This is the grace of God upon Jeremiah's life. So Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, sorry, the Rabsaris, Nergal Sar Ezer, the Rab Mag, and all the chief officers of the king of Babylon sent and took Jeremiah from the court of the guard. Now we see more details on this taking of Jeremiah in chapter 40. They entrusted him to get Eliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, that he should take him home. So he lived among the people. So he forwent the security of Babylon and chose to live among the poor and the people that he loved. So he could have actually been safe in Babylon, but instead he stays among the people because he loves them that much. He really was for their welfare. And by the grace of God, Nebuchadnezzar is actually treating Jeremiah better than even Jeremiah's own people did. The own, his own people from Anaroth treated him so cruelly and so poorly, and Nebuchadnezzar is actually treating him better. Now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the guard, Go and say to Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will fulfill my words against this city for harm and not for good, and they shall be accomplished before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord. So remember, he's the one who helps Jeremiah out uh, by pleading to the king, and therefore God is going to honor him for it. But I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely save you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war, because you have put your trust in me, declares the Lord. So even if this Ethiopian was not a man of faith or not a follower of God, he obviously believed in God and listened to him. And just as Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, he was merciful right to Jeremiah for they shall themselves receive mercy so he does receive mercy in the end here now here in chapter 40 we see more of those details on Jeremiah remaining in Judah the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Nebuzaradan the captain of the guard had let him go from Ramah Ramah being five miles north of Jerusalem when he took him bound in chains along with all the captives of Jerusalem and Judah who were being exiled to Babylon the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God pronounced this disaster against this place. The Lord has brought it about and has done as he said. Because you sinned against the Lord and did not obey his voice, this thing has come upon you. So he had more faith in the word than even God's people did. Now behold, I release you today from the chains on your hands. If it seems good to you to come with me to Babylon, come and I will look after you well. But if it seems wrong to you to come to ba uh, come with me to Babylon, do not come. See, the whole land is before you. Go wherever you think it good and right to go. And if you remain, then return to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon appointed governor of the cities of Judah, and dwell with him among the people, or go wherever you think right to go. So here are the three choices. You can either go to Babylon with him. He can... Uh, stay here and not go, or he can simply go wherever he wants. Now, Gedaliah is the person that Nebuchadnezzar chose uh, he, because he had admin experience. Even though he was not in the royal line of David, Nebuchadnezzar chose him nonetheless. Ahikam, remember, he was the one who was sent to Huldah, the prophetess. He was one of the men. And he actually protected Jeremiah after the temple sermon in chapter 26. And then Shaphan, we heard from him in 2 Kings 22, was Josiah's secretary who carried the newly found scroll to the king. 
So just a reference of who these men were. Um, that is who will look after Jeremiah. So the captain of the guard gave him an allowance of food and a present and let him go. Then Jeremiah went to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, at Mizpah and lived with him among the people who were left in the land. So Mizpah is about five miles north of Jerusalem, or eight miles north of Jerusalem. So he ended up choosing choice number two. Now, when all the captains of the forces in the open country and their men heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, governor in the land, and had committed to him men, women, and children, those of the poorest of the land who had not been taken into exile to Babylon, they went to Gedaliah at Mizpah. Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, Johanan, the son of Korea, Sariah, the son of Tenhumeth, the sons of Ephi, the Netophathite, Jezaniah, the son of Maacathite, and they and their men. Now Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, swore to them, saying, or swore to them and their men, saying, Do not be afraid to serve the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land, serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. As for me, I will dwell at Mizpah to represent you before the Chaldeans who come to us. But as for you, gather wine and summer fruits and oil and store them in your vessels and dwell in your cities that you have taken. Likewise, when all the Judeans who were in Moab and among the Ammonites and in Edom and in other lands heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant in Judah and had appointed Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, as governor over them, then all the Judeans returned from all the places to which they had been driven and came to the land of Judah. So these are the ones who escaped. And they came to Gedaliah at Mizpah and they gathered wine and summer fruits in great abundance. So they're going back to this normal life with a blessing. Now, Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the leaders of the forces in the open country came to get Eliah at Mizpah and said to him, Do you know that Baalis, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to take your life? Now, Ishmael was of royal heritage, and he is anti-Babylon and jealous of Gedaliah, and he hated him. And so he probably wants, you know, a chance at his throne. Now, what's sad here is that Gedaliah is such a good and cool dude that he is totally naive to this message here. But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, would not believe them. Then Johanan, the son of Korea, spoke secretly to Gedaliah at Mizpah. Please let me go and strike down Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and no one will know it. Why should he take your life so that all the Judeans who are gathered about you will be scattered and the remnant of Judah would perish? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, said to Johanan, the son of Korea, you shall not do this thing, for you are speaking falsely of Ishmael. So he is simply way too trusting here and doesn't believe that Ishmael would actually kill him. And so sadly, he is going to suffer detrimental fate because he does not believe this word. So we're going to pause from the judgment being spoken by Jeremiah and that narrative. And we are turning over to the Psalms, uh, 74 and 79, both of these being songs of lament after the Babylonian invasion. And so this one being a masculine or a song of instruction from Asaph. Now we don't know if this is the typical Asaph in the Psalms. This may have been a later Asaph. Or some scholars believe that this is the same Asaph in all of the Psalms, but he had penned a prophetic Psalm. But whether or not this is a different Asaph or the same one, the message is what it is. Oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? So basically everything is smoldering here in Jerusalem and Judah, uh, everything devastated. They're therefore questioning God. And a lot of the time, our questions to God are fueled from faith. It's not fueled from unbelief. It is fueled by, God, I know that you are a good God. I know that you can do these things. Why then are we suffering? And that's actually faith speaking. That's actually not unbelief, right? Remember your congregation. So they're, they're trying to appeal to what God had done in the past. Like maybe if you remember God, who your people are, which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. So remember you've purchased them, you've redeemed them, ransom, paid the ransom, and they are your people. Remember Mount Zion where you made a covenant, where you have dwelt. 
direct your steps to the perpetual ruin. So they're asking him, come back, Lord. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. Your foes have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their own signs for signs. They were like those who swing axes in a forest of trees and all its carved wood they broke down with hatchets and hammers. So this is referring to the temple that they have destroyed. So this is a plea, this is a prayer, again, pleading the past faithfulness of God and almost like a community lament here. Uh, Lord, if please remember us, right? They set your sanctuary on fire. They profane the dwelling place of your name, bringing it down to the ground. And they said to themselves, we will utterly subdue them. They burned all the meeting places of God in the land. Notice all of the names of the temple here, the sanctuary, the dwelling place, meeting place, sanctuary, already said that. Uh, so different names for the temple. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet. There is none among us who knows how long. So basically no spirituality is left here in Jerusalem. How long, O oh God, is the foe to scoff? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? So the right hand being the might and the ability and the strength of God. Now, obviously God still has this ability and he is appealing to this strength. So this is still showing some great faith here. Yet God, my King, is from old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might, obviously the Red Sea. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of the Leviathan. Now this could be poetic for Egypt, but Leviathan was a um, mythological creature, like a serpent, a sea serpent. And they use this as a reference, but eventually in the Bible, Satan himself is actually referred to as Leviathan, and his name actually means twisting one, so that makes sense. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You split open springs and brooks, and you dried up overflowing streams. Yours is the day, yours also the night. So he is pleading now to the power and authority of God over his creation. You have established the heavenly lights and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made a su uh, summer and winter. So remember this, O Lord, how the enemy scoffs and a foolish people reviles your name. Do not deliver the soul of your dove to the wild beasts. So this dove usually declaring this simple and harmless, meek nature of the people. Uh, people are faithful or they were at one time. So he's trying to make him remember that these were the way, this was the way your people once were. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. So these two terms are actually endearing terms that he is trying to use to appeal to God's heart. Have regard for the covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. So arise, O God. Defend your cause or your reputation. Remember how the foolish scoff at you all the day. So Asaph here is more concerned with the glory, the reputation, the name of God. Do not forget the clamor of your foes, the uproar of those who rise against you, which goes up continually. So we end here in this psalm with an urgent plea from Asaph. And then Psalm 79 being very similar to that of Psalm 74, another community lament. And the moral of this one is please don't let history repeat itself. Like we've seen what has happened. And the word here though for the people is do not defile the temple for it has been desecrated. Oh God, the nations have come into your inheritance. So his inheritance being both the land and the people. And when he speaks of the nations, that being Babylon and the other nations that served in the Babylonian army, they have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. So while the enemy here has defiled the physical temple of God, our body is a holy temple of God and sin will be the very thing. Sin will be the nation that defiles our holy temple. So we have to be the one in control of that, battling that spiritual battle to fight against the flesh, the sin nature. They have given the bodies of your servants to the birds of the heavens for food, the flesh of your faithful to the beasts of the earth. So again, sin will lead to death of relationships, of health, of happiness, of all things good. 
They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. We have become a taunt to our neighbors, mocked and derided by those around us. So he is just describing here this devastation of Jerusalem and lamenting for it. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call upon your name. So he's like, not on us, Lord. Curse the enemy. This is pretty typical of a psalm of lament. Um, They would usually base it on the covenantal provision of I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And so that's what he's trying to appeal to, therefore calling for punishment on the enemies of Jerusalem. Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you, for they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. Well, of course, because sin will always devour and always destroy, will always tear down. Help us, O God, of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us, atone for our sins. So this is a plea now for forgiveness and deliverance. For your name's sake, again, this being all about the glory of God and the reputation of his name. Why should the nation say, where's their God? Of course, this being their international reputation. Let the avenging of the outpoured blood of your servants be known among the nations before our eyes. Let the groans or the cries of the prisoners come before you according to your great power. Preserve those doomed to die. Return sevenfold into the lap of our neighbors, the taunts with which they have taunted you, O Lord. But we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. So he ends here with a prayer asking God for help and him in return vowing to praise God the Lord. And now we are into the reading of day 231, starting off here in 2 Kings chapter 24. So we are getting a little recap of the last five kings of Judah. So this starting off here in 605 BC, in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon came up and Jehoiakim, this being a very patriotic king, but he was never really a servant of God became his servant for three years. So he becomes a servant by way of serving him as a vassal state to Babylon. Then he returned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldeans and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the Ammonites and sent them against Judah to destroy it. Now the Chaldeans, this actually means soothsayer. And this is just another name for Neo-Babylonians and the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Uh, Where are we? According to the word of the Lord that he spoke by his servants, the prophets, surely this came upon Judah at the command of the Lord to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he had done and also for the innocent blood that he had shed. So notice we are hearing from Manasseh again. And he was from way before. Well, it is because the effects of Manasseh's sin is still being being felt here 50 years after his death. So the sin, you know, even if you don't reap what you sow in your own lifetime, it will continue to be reaped in future generations. Unless, of course, broken by those who become believers or those who come to repentance. But here the people didn't, and so they are feeling the effects of his sin. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not pardon. Now the rest of the deeds of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Jehoiakim slept with his fathers, and Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. And the king of Egypt did not come again out of this land, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates." Jehoiakim. Now he was 18 years old. Some translations, or actually I believe it was in another chapter, it said that he was eight years old, but this was probably a scribal error. So we believe that he was actually 18. Now Jehoiakim, his name means the Lord has appointed. So when he became king and he reigned only three months in Jerusalem, not a very blessed reign, his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. Now at that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, 
came up to Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon, himself, his mother, his servants, and his officials, and his palace officials. The king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign, and carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the uh, treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord, which Solomon, king of Israel, had made as the Lord had foretold. He carried away all Jerusalem and all the officials and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and the smiths. None remained except the poorest of the people in the land. So in a sense here, being poor actually paid off for the people. And that is still the case. You know, sometimes wealth can actually be more trouble than if you were poor. Now, I'm not saying wealth is bad. Wealth can be a very good thing if stewarded wisely. But in this case, for the people, being poor was actually for their betterment. And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon, the king's mother, the king's wives, officials, the chief men of the land he took into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon all the men of valor, 7,000, and the craftsmen, the metal workers, 1,000, all of them strong and fit for war. And the king of Babylon made Mataniah, which means the gift of the Lord, Jehoiakim's uncle, king in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. So this is the last ruler of Judah before the fall of Jerusalem. Now Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. So Zedekiah is essentially this evil puppet king who is basically in charge of only peasants at this point. And his rebellion is going to bring the king back to destroy Judah. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that Jehoiakim had, Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord it came to the point in Jerusalem and Judah that he cast them out from his presence. And Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So basically, his patience has run out. Now here in chapter 25, seeing more of the details of what we just read about as the siege around Jerusalem, this two-year siege uh, is in place. And in the ninth year of his reign, in the 10th month, on the 10th day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works So siege works would be like this surrounding to be able to stop all business and trade into Jerusalem. And that will essentially create a famine and create fear. So the city was besieged till the 11th year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then a breach was made in the city and all the men of the war of war fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls by the king's garden and the chaldeans were around the city so this is the escape route being between two walls possibly carved by solomon and they went in the direction of the Araba, but the army of the chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of jericho and all his army was scattered from him then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of babylon at riblah and they passed sentence on him They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains and took him to Babylon. So we just read about this. In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. And he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. So these walls acted as safety and security, and now that is gone. Now, of course, it will be rebuilt 150 years later in the book of Nehemiah. And the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted the king of Babylon... Together with the rest of the multitude, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. Now this was, again, to avoid the land becoming a wilderness. So this is the third wave of uh, the exile. And the pillars of bronze that were in the house of the Lord and the stands and the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried the bronze to Babylon. And they took away the pots and the shovels and the snuffers and the dishes for incense and the vessels of bronze. 
used in the temple service, the fire pans, and the bowls. What was of gold the captain of the guard took away as gold, and what was of silver as silver? As for the two pillars, the one sea and the vessels was beyond weight. The height of the one pillar was 18 cubits, and on it was a capital of bronze. The height of the capital was three cubits, a lattice work, and pomegranates, all of bronze, were all around the capital. And the second pillar had the same with lattice work. So essentially they were completely plundered. And the captain of the guard took Sareah the chief priest, and Zephaniah the second priest, and the three keepers of the threshold. And from the city he took an officer who had been in command of the men of war, and five men of the king's council who were found in the city, and the secretary of the commander of the army who mustered the people of the land, and sixty men of the people of the land, who were found in the city. And Nebuzaradan the captain of the guard took them and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Riblah in the land of the Hamath. So Judah was taken into exile out of its land. So they carried away, uh, they were carried away because of their own apostasy. So this isn't just a cruel taking away of Babylon. This was actually, again, reaping what they sowed. So now Babylon is officially in complete control. And we are seeing this final deportation happening. And over the people who remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left, he appointed Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, for governor. So Gedaliah, again, was Jeremiah's friend. And he was in authority over the remnant of Judah, and he wisely counsels them. Now, when the captains and their men heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah governor, they came with their men to Gedaliah at Mizpah. And Mizpah was like the spiritual and political center of this time. The son of Tenhumeth, the Netophathite, and Jeazaniah, the son of the Maacathite. And Gedaliah swore to them and their men, saying, Do not be afraid because of the Chaldean officials. Live in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. So he's telling them, Dwell peaceably under the Babylonian rule. But in the seventh month, Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, son of Elishama of the royal family, came with ten men and struck down Gedaliah and put him to death along with the Jews and the Chaldeans who were with him at Mizpah. Then all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the forces arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. Now in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, Evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, so somewhere between 561 and 560 BC, graciously freed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. And now, why is he showing him kindness? Well, one, he actually may have been imprisoned before, so he knows what it's like, or he may have actually been converted by Daniel. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim put off his prison garments, and every day of his life he dined regularly at the king's table, and for his allowance, a regular allowance, was given him by the king, according to his daily needs, as long as he lived. So here we end with this ray of hope, kind of this small glimmer of grace, that there are uh, greater circumstances to come. This is something that I am holding on today, to today, as I am so weary, and so tired and just thinking about my daddy i just keep having visions of him and i'm holding on that the greater times are to come so the exile does not end israel nor does it destroy the davidic line we will still see god's promise of restoration in place now just as he showed kindness to jehoiakim here jesus shows us that same kindness he takes off our prisoners' robes. He gives us robes of righteousness. He seats us in heavenly places. He frees us of our captivity. And you can't help but see him in this story here and just be so grateful for the kindness that he gives back to us when we so do not deserve it. We are ending here in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. 
the people of the land took Jehoahaz. And now Jehoahaz is also known as Shalom. His mean, uh, name means the Lord has seized. Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah. And now Josiah has four sons, three of which will rule, and made him king in his father's place in Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. Then the king of Egypt, who happens to be Nico. Now he, interestingly enough, is not included in Matthew chapter 1, implying that he was probably elected by popular vote, and therefore this is not true secession or an appointment by God. So then the king of Egypt deposed him in Jerusalem and laid on the land a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And the king of Egypt made Eliakim, his brother, king, rule over Judah and Jerusalem and changed his name to Jehoiakim. And he changed his name in order to display his power and authority over him. But Necho took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him to Egypt. So basically now they have become a vassal state in order to you know, leave them as a buffer between them and Babylon. So Judah is officially now poor and weak. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord as God. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. So this is the first deportation. So mind you, we are um, di we are going back in time and chronologically. So this is the first deportation in 605 BC. And remember, Jehoiakim is a puppet king who imposed heavy taxes on the people in order to pay Egypt because of the fact that they're a vassal state. So he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord as God. Against him up, came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried part of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon to put them in his palace in Babylon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and the abominations that he did and what was found against him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. Now remember, Jehoiakim was the one who actually burned a scroll. He also killed Urijah. Even though he had loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar at one point, he did so for three years, he ends up rebelling against him. Now Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months and 10 days in Jerusalem. So this is about 597 BC during the second deportation. Let me turn this light on because the sun just went away. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. In the spring of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the precious vessels of the house of the Lord and made his brother Zedekiah king over Judah and Jerusalem. And this was the point in time where only the poor are left in Jerusalem. Now he is also known as Jeconiah or Coniah. Then we have Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. So he was the youngest of the sons also known as Mataniah, Jehoiakim's brother, and his name means the Lord is righteous. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord as God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by the Lord, no, by God. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, the reason why he ends up rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar is because the false prophets were preaching peace and basically gave him a false sense of security, which ends up prompting that two-year siege of Babylon against Jerusalem. All the officers and the priests and the people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations, and they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no more remedy. And this is the most tragic statement right here. I mean, again, I say it all the time that when I used to read the Old Testament, I didn't like it because it seemed so doomy and gloomy. It seemed like God was cruel. And a lot of people will think that they're like, I don't want to read the Old Testament because that was the old angry God. But when you do read it and you read it with intention. You understand that it was out of compassion, out of the goodness of God's heart that he did what he did. He was always waiting 
for them to return, providing for them, loving for them, giving them clear directions. It was because of their choice to not obey and to sin that he had to come and say, well, you know what? If my goodness isn't going to work, I'm going to have to poke at you a little bit. It's going to have to hurt a little bit so that you will then turn around and come back home. And that's exactly what was happening here with Jerusalem and obviously with Israel. Therefore, he brought up against the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or aged. So they were swift, they were cruel, and the king of the Chaldeans, of course, he reigned from 605 to 562. This was Nebuchadnezzar that we're talking about because the Chaldeans is the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And so this section here happening around 586 B.C., He gave them all into his hand, and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burned the house of God, and broke down the wall of Jerusalem, and burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious vessels. He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons, until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. Now, what is going on here with the whole Sabbath? Well, they had been neglecting the Sabbath year now for 490 years. So God is declaring, you know what? You guys have been neglecting the Sabbath year, which is every seven years you let the land rest. And this wasn't a cruel thing because he would provide double for them in the sixth year for them to store up for the Sabbath year. But they neglected it because they said, you know what, let's just keep working. Let's let's work so we can get a surplus. So they neglected it. And now God is saying, you know what, you owe me 70 years of the Sabbath rest for the land, which you did not honor. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Now, nothing here is spared by Babylon. Of course, they are the instrument by which God uses for his judgment. And the temple was gone. The walls were gone. So we're seeing both physical and spiritual destruction here. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, so now we're introduced to Cyrus. We heard about him, I think, in Isaiah when it was declared that he would be the one to actually be used by God to then bring judgment upon Babylon. So Cyrus, king of Persia that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. So now we are fulfilling that portion of the promise that the people would return home and they would then rebuild Jerusalem. Now, sadly, only a small percentage of the people end up returning to Jerusalem. So we are ending Second Chronicles with a new beginning, with a fresh start. And I love that. You know, God always comes back to redemption, comes back to revival, comes back to being reborn and renewed. Now, the Persians and the Medes are the ones who end up conquering Babylon. They're the ones who end up freeing the Israelite captives. And this happening in 539 BC. And this Israelites are freed. That's going to happen after Persia has come to power. So they are going to conquer Babylon first, and then they're going to rise to power. And then the Israelites will be freed. So this just brings me so much hope today in this word of seeing the heartbeat of God that he rescues us out of the pits to this day. He welcomes all, you know, when he welcomes the Ethiopian or he welcomes people like Cyrus that even if we, you know, the ones who weren't even worshiping him, he can use them for his good. Uh, He is our deliverer. He frees us up from prison. He speaks kindly to us. He sets us on a high place. He gives us new garments. He gives us freedom. He gives us provision. He continues to protect us. And that is what we have to hold on to because if we don't hold on to the heart of God, it is so easy to be swept away by the hurt of today, by the hurt of the circumstances around us, of the world around us, of things that are happening in our own lives and 
in our own families and that is what we have to cling to in order to maintain our strength because when we say things like the Lord is our strength that's where it comes from it comes from the promise of God and the faith by which we hold on to that promise that is what strengthens us it's not just this boop you get strength it's actually building the strength by being in the word and by knowing the character in the heart of God and by by holding on to it by understanding it so I am grateful for that today I needed that today and it only continues it's amazing how the word of God will parallel exactly what is going on in your life he just knows that you need to hear something specific and I hope that you were able to catch a glimmer of something today I hope he spoke to you personally let us know in the comments if he did if, if there was anything specific that he touched your heart with and I feel like that always encourages other people but I let you know what encouraged my heart and let's just say thank you to the Lord we just love you so much father for speaking to us in such a way that is so personal that is always right on time god you don't show up late you don't show up early you know exactly when we need to hear a word even if we're off schedule by the way of this bible study or even if someone is showing up now to watch day 230 and 231 and we're already in year 2026 it doesn't matter where we are at god you meet us there because we are seeking you and so thank you for that thank you for being our good father thank you for being our savior our rescuer the one who brings us out and gives us hope and gives us freedom. Lord, may we never take it for granted. May we never be blinded to that, God, because the enemy will try to come in and he will try to blind us from your goodness. But your goodness is still on high. It is still on the throne. It is still moving throughout this earth. So may we be able to be people who reflect that goodness to others and share that love and that kindness. So thank you for this word, this time, for this community. I'm so extra grateful for it today, God. And all of the prayers, everyone who uttered a prayer, God, for my father, will you bless them? Will you bless every person who did it, Lord? And maybe who just didn't even know what was going on because we are brothers and we are sisters and we are banding together in unity for your purpose. And that is all that matters. God, we are kingdom builders. And I'm just glad to be able to link arms with every single person who is here today. So I pray that you meet them where they're at. Give them a big hug. Let them know you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I want to give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer. I'm gonna put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.